another one of our, our webinars and our series of webinars that we have been providing our uh, members over the course of this past year. I'm particularly excited about this webinar tonight on surgical innovation, uh, centered around case discussions um, with a pancreas, liver, and a biliary case. I wanna thank um, all of our moderators and our speakers tonight for uh, joining us and sharing themselves and their expertise with us. And in particular, I really want to thank Dr. Polanco from UT Southwestern for organizing this webinar tonight and taking the leader, leading role in pulling this all together. So welcome, I think we're gonna have a great evening. And with that, I'll turn things over to Patricio. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you, Propolic. Uh, I would definitely uh, like to thank you, Propolic and the HPV leadership for allowing us to organize this uh, case discussion webinar from the Surgical Innovation Committee. Also wanna thank uh, Margie Malia and Jill Wilhide uh, from the HPV administration for putting it all together. Um, for the audience that is uh, assuming joining us now, uh, we will discuss three uh, interesting and some of them challenging HPV cases on which uh, conventional and non-conventional treatments will be discussed. Uh, case will be presented by moderators and discussed with the panelists. At the end of each case uh, that will roughly take uh, 22 to 24 minutes, we will have a almost rapid fire Q&A questions and answers to clarify some concepts and to address some of the questions uh, that the audience may have. So uh, we encourage the online audience to submit uh, your questions via chat. Uh, some of them will be selected to be asked to our panelists. Without uh, further ado, I would like to introduce our uh, PAMCAS uh, case panelists. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Eileen O'Reilly from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dr. Christina Ferrone from uh, Mass General Hospital of Harvard University, and Dr. Amir Zurika from University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. The case will be presented and moderated by Dr. Curtis Ray from UT uh, Health in Houston. Take it away, Dr. Ray. You're, you're mute. Unmuted, okay, sharing my screen, starting now. I'd like to thank the uh, AHPBA for the opportunity to uh, present uh, you know, this, this webinar. So let's, uh, let's dive right into the case presentation. So one year ago, a uh, previously healthy 60 year old female with mild chronic kidney disease and diabetes mellitus type two presents to the emergency room. She presents with jaundice, diarrhea, and an unintended 20 pound weight loss. In the emergency room, she underwent a CT, she had elevated bilirubin uh, up greater than 10 and a CT scan that demonstrated an ill-defined pancreas head mass. She was uh, placed in observation, surgery cons consult, as well as a gastroenterology consult. MRI was obtained. Uh, pancreas protocol, which demonstrated a 3.8 by 3.0 centimeter pancreatic head mass. And at her initial diagnosis, the CA199 tumor marker was 310. Reviewing uh, her imaging, the, the CT scan, we noted she'd had a prior cholecystectomy and the CT revealed dilated extrahepatic bile ducts. So for this is going from the top down towards the bottom. So dilated extrahepatic pancreas or, or bile duct, calcified splenic artery. Uh, she has a dilated pancreatic duct in the body and tail that we see. And as we scroll down further, uh, we start to see a, a additional arterial structure uh, running through the head of the pancreas going towards the superior mesenteric artery, which in this case uh, is a, a slightly uncommon anatomic variant where her common hepatic artery arises from the superior mesenteric artery, seen in approximately less than 5% of cases. So at this point, although we don't have a diagnosis of pancreas cancer yet, we're very concerned. Uh, many of us are all too aware of the, the spectrum of how this awful disease uh, presents. And in this case, we're uh, very concerned 
that she has a pancreas head mass and what appears to be a uh, her common hepatic artery going straight from her SMA directly into this mass and then towards the liver. Which brings us to the topic of this conversation about pancreas cancer, which are those who are locally advanced. And looking at our NCCN uh, guidelines, as well as a definition, our consensus definition of locally advanced pancreas cancer, a distinct subset or distinct subset of pancreas cancer different than borderline are those with uh, head uncinate process lesions with tumor contact of the SMA greater than 180 degrees or celiac artery greater than 180 degrees with or possibly with unreconstructable SMV portal vein uh, due to involvement or thrombus. So in this case, Standard ERCP, EUS, endoscopic ultrasound, and uh, fine needle aspiration biopsy uh, was performed, uh, and a diagnosis of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma uh, was, was made as she was uh, admitted to us. So again, back to our, our consensus definition of locally advanced disease, you know, long segment occlusion of SMV portal vein or greater than 180 degree involvement of superior mesenteric artery, uh, hepatic artery, or uh, celiac trunk. So this is, is gonna be my first question to the panel. Would, would all of our panelists agree that, that in this case, this meets the definition of uh, locally advanced disease? Yes, I would agree. Yeah, completely concur and uh, would propose a non-operative initial uh, management plan here. Yep, agreed. Locally advanced disease. Great. And it, in this case, it, so we, we blow this up a little bit. Now we see our, our common hepatic artery that are, had risen from the SMA going directly uh, in, into this mass. So this patient's actually a, a very well-educated individual, and she's asking, "Well, how how do we how do we treat this?" Um, and uh, when we when we look at our guidelines, I think one thing that we conclude is that really uh, we really at this point truly don't know optimum preoperative management. Clinical trial obviously preferred if there's one available. Uh, systemic therapy, induction chemotherapy, you know, et cetera. Several different different choices, but surgery first doesn't seem like that's the, the right answer here. In a patient with good performance status, no disease progression, uh, then possibly considering resection plus or minus, you know, adjuvant, adjuvant therapy versus continued observation or surveillance or continuing, you know, chemotherapy. So, She's asking about treatment options, and and one of the panelists mentioned this, but would anybody would anybody recommend a, a surgery first approach in 2021? I think Eileen gets to go first. <laughs> yeah, so I think th thinking about this, what's the probability of getting an optimal oncologic resection is very low here, and uh, R zero is the goal, and in the absence of that. I think the totality of the data would support a neoadjuvant intent a treatment plan with the initial focus being on systemic therapy rather than I would argue an initial radiation strategy and multidisciplinary iterative review here of the imaging in the context of how the patient is responding with regard to which local modalities uh, could be applied to maximize the potential to get to surgery. So that would be the initial thinking and uh, choice, you know, if one accepts that, would come down to outside of a trial, which of the standard therapy combination cytotoxic options is preferred. I think for a fit individual, uh, fulfirinox or modified fulfirinox with adjustment of the dosing without bolus 5-FU would be our recommendation as the initial step with an alternative option of gemcitabine and not paclitaxel. So, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the interesting papers that really kind of looking at this, uh, Dr. Ferroni is one of, one of your papers from the past couple of years where your institutional experience compared those that had surgery first versus, um, you know, upfront chemotherapy. 
And I think those results would, would really point towards uh, upfront systemic treatment definitely would be the, would the preferred, preferred approach. And again, historically, many of these patients uh, uh, nationwide were really treated with chemotherapy only. And in those that had select cases, maybe uh, escalating doses of chemo plus chemo, chemo radiation. But here in this case, as, as Dr. Riley suggested, we started out, you know, great performance status. Uh, so we started out with four cycles of uh, modified full fear and ox, so, so two months of treatment. And uh, what was encouraging, or is encouraging, is the fact that we had a nice biochemical response with the CA199 that rapidly, uh, rapidly dropped once, once she was uh, started on treatment and trended downwards. So after, after two months of treatment, four cycles, we re-imaged and saw that we had a very small response to treatment. Tumor was maybe a little bit smaller, depending upon how, how I think how you looked and, and measured, the, measured the CT scan. So back to the panel, now what? What would you do? Hey, at our institution, I mean, obviously, you know, Eileen O'Reilly is the medical oncologist who has the most experience in the United States for pancreas cancer. Uh, and I would agree with her wholeheartedly in, in, that we would also treat with uh, full furanox up front. We usually give eight cycles, so four months of full furanox with re-imaging after four cycles. Um, if we saw the CA99 going up or progression of disease, we would then switch therapies. Um, so at this point, after four cycles, we would continue with an additional four cycles, assuming that the patient doesn't have significant toxicity. Yeah, thanks. To, to add to that, if I might, I would say this is a very common dilemma, right? The imaging is the same, patients feeling better, symptoms have improved, markers down, and what to do. And I think there's a bit of a lag here between the imaging often and how the response is evolving and would completely uh, concur with Christina that one would sit tight if all the other parameters are in a positive direction. So this is, this is the kind of provocative question that's out there. Should we be thinking about a switch in, in this point? And I think in, in the absence of progression, as we know is, uh, my bias here would be to continue. Okay, so that's, a, that's, a, that's what we did. We continued with the uh, full fear and ox and again, saw CA199 continue to trend downward. But again, I'll ask that question that you kind of mentioned in those cases where CA199 may stop responding and increase, I heard someone rec uh, suggest switching regimens. So you would suggest potentially switching to the, you know, gemcitabine, nab, paclitaxel regimen for? I think Eileen can address this much better than, than I can. Um, so I would defer to her. Yeah, I think it again depends on the totality of, of the information. If there's no other cause for the CN99, the stent hasn't occluded, there's no component of pancreatitis, pain is worse, feeling less well, then yes, that, that's a concern. But this trajectory on the CN99 with stability on the image and clinical improvement, one would continue. I, I know our colleagues at, at, at Mayo are, are raising this question of should we be thinking about switching therapy after you know, four cycles or eight weeks if we're not seeing any overt radiologic response? And I think that's, that's something we don't know, but there, there is some data that's emerging that's suggesting for several patients, this might be a role. And as we get, in, get better at beginning to refine therapy selection based on either pathologic markers or genomic markers, then I think we'll be on firmer grounds for, for recommending a change. But for, again, for this patient, I would sit tight. And maybe as a medical oncologist, I'll also just bring to the fore the, the question of advocating for germline testing on, on all of these patients and where tissue is available, trying to get uh, tissue-based somatic uh, profiling. And while ctDNA can be attractive, especially when it's hard to get tissue in the locally advanced setting, I still think we have a lot of work to do uh, to work out the, the role of ctDNA in this setting. Although again, there's a lot of really interesting data emerging and that might be something that could give a more proximate sense over imaging and the clinical picture in terms of this question of whether a switch is warranted. Fantastic. 
so she tolerated systemic therapy very well. And she, um, she, so she's now been through uh, four months of Fulfirinox, um, did great and feels well. And as you mentioned, her, many of her symptoms have improved. And the question being at this point, now what do we proceed to surgery? Would anybody go straight to surgery at this point or, or something else? I think, yeah, I think you can consider surgery. I think you've had the CA199 normalized, which is one of the metrics that we really strive for when we're looking at locally advanced disease. Now, although it did normalize after two months, because this is a, an extensive resection, we would favor, as Eileen and, and Christina were saying, some, something in the region of four to six months of chemo. So certainly the CA199 has normalized. Um, I don't think you're with complete encasement of a common hepatic artery. In our experience, it's hard to see the tumor shrink away from that blood vessel completely. Uh, in fact, often when you start with SMA encirclement or encasement, you end up with SMA encasement at the end of chemotherapy. So uh, the question here is whether to give radiation at this stage, uh, pursue surgery uh, following radiation or surgery up front, or um, depending on the lack or presence of expertise in terms of vascular reconstruction, you might decide to do definitive radiation as well. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's an option. Uh, but certainly um, I would consider surgery uh, at, at that. I, I would consider all three of those options, but certainly surgery is on the table here and probably something that we would pursue. I guess I would say that I probably would not go to the operating room at this point, and I would plan on having the patient get 50.4 gray of radiation for two reasons. One, uh, we tend to see more of a response with the 50.4 gray, and it also gives us the test of time, right? Because that's five and a half weeks of radiation plus an additional six weeks of you know, of a break before we go to the operating room. And when we look at our data for the first site of progression in patients who've gotten neoadjuvant therapy or in patients who have not gotten neoadjuvant therapy, the pattern of recurrence is exactly the same. 70% approximately. So the majority of patients will present with distant metastases as the first site of disease progression. And this is why Eileen really holds the key to their survival more so than, than we do. So in, in this case, we, we did proceed with radiation. So we did go to the 50.4 gray and that, you know, they get again, buy us an additional, you know, three, three to three and a half months again, really didn't change. We really did not see a change in the size of the, of the lesion. And now we're at the point of deciding, truly deciding surgery or, or something else. Um, and at this point, uh, really, we, we did not have anything else uh, to offer and felt that, you know, surgery was the, was the next stop knowing that there's, you know, a high likelihood that uh, this may be a very, very complicated operation. So we started out with a diagnostic laparoscopy. I, I'm assuming most of the panelists would, would, still do diagnostic laparoscopy or just dive straight in? I do a diagnostic laparoscopy. Agreed. In a few cases, you know, it saves, saves a big headache, I think, if, if you do a diagnostic laparoscopy. So now we're thinking about our standard, you know, pancreatico duodenectomy or, or Whipple operation. In this case, you know, how do we manage the common hepatic artery? Well, what would you guys suggest? I think you've got two options here. Obviously, uh, one technique would be divestment, which is essentially opening up a plane between the adventitia uh, of the vessel and uh, the tumor, uh, especially the uh, you know the nerve sheath complex around the around the artery. Um, and the other would be to resect the actual artery with reconstruction. And these are obviously two um, morbid. Uh, morbid options. So certainly expertise and, and uh, the av availability of vascular reconstruction needs to be kind of laid out beforehand. Uh, but certainly if you're proceeding with a Whipple uh, and you've got encasement of that vessel, it's hard 
it, it's hard not to do one of those two options. So I would say that we tend to favor the arterial divestment with sequential biopsies along the artery because it is a very bad prognostic indicator if that is all still live tumor. Now, that being said, it is a lot of work for the pathologists to get five, eight, 10, 15 frozen sections during the operation with a significant amount of treatment effect. Um, but we find that if you can do an arterial divestment, because most of the tissue is fibrotic, just because the imaging is no longer as reliable. And I saw that Sky Mayo put in the chat about the question of, you know, functional PET MRI as a way to measure a uh, response. We have not, um, I, I don't think RN at MGH is large enough to make any solid conclusions about uh, the prediction of PET MRI. I am very hopeful for all the radiomics studies that they could help us uh, in deciding on this. And, and just to address Jin He's question about why not do diagnostic laparoscopy before radiation? We tend to do it right before we start the operation just to avoid a second general anesthesia. But I don't know if Amr uh, or any, uh, any other uh, panelists who are on feel differently about that. I mean, one argument against doing it earlier, you've used biology and time and treatment response and the CA99 decline. So I think in this setting, the yield is likely fairly low. It's not zero. And it makes sense, I think, to combine it with, with surgery as a staging procedure. I mean, you could still argue in this patient that even, even if there was microscopic disease elsewhere, there may still be a role for local regional disease control, short of surgery with radiation. So uh, Christina, if I may ask, just because we differed on the radiation aspect here. So do you feel that divestment is easier after you've radiated patients? You know, I, I think it, it gives us a better prediction of how the tumor has responded, right? Because I know that if I start the divestment and send off a bunch of biopsies and it's all live tumor, then most likely the response has not been as encouraging as we had predicted. Um, so if you have our transplant yeah. surgeons do the arterial reconstruction. I, I don't do them myself. I just ask one of the transplant surgeons to do it. And they obviously do a, an excellent technical job. But I... I feel like it's it's more predictive of the biology of the disease and it gives me the opportunity to stop. And if the biopsies are positive, do you actually, when you say stop, obviously to get to that stage, you've burnt a lot of bridges, but to get to that stage and, and your biopsy along the SMA, would you actually abort and kind of finish up with an R2 resection uh, or or do you do you proceed? Yeah, so that's a great point, right? So how far along are you down the path? And, you know, for these neoadjuvant cases, I think it's really important to approach the tumor from the left or you approach the tumor from the right in the more traditional way, but also by taking down the LOT and really exposing the SMA from the left so that you can see that origin off of the aorta and try to really get it skeletonized or divested. Um, so, but you're right, if you start to burn bridges where the last part is where you figure it out. I mean, honestly, I don't think you really have a choice. And then we consider the arterial reconstruction. If we think it's somebody who's not gonna tolerate a significant amount of clamping time, and we feel that we're getting down to an R1 resection, I mean, we at least try to get an R1 resection, then we use intraoperative radiation therapy as an extra boost of somewhere between 10 and 15 gray to that local regional area. I think those are all excellent points. I know we're running up near the, the end of this uh, presentation, but I, I think that's a great point because obviously you really have to get very far into the operation and make this decision. And as you said, if you've burned bridges, now you may find yourself in a, a very uncomfortable situation of, of performing an R2 Whipple, which I think most of us on this call would really, really uh, try to avoid as, as much as possible. So. Lastly, uh, at this point, other treatment options that uh, Dr. Ferroni mentioned, IORT, 
Uh, I think that uh, is still uh, an evolving concept, IRE and additional clinical trials. And I'd like to thank the panelists for all their great, great comments and uh, a lot of work that uh, went, went into making this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you. Thank you. All right, don't go yet. Uh, we still have some questions from the audience and thank you for addressing some of them, Dr. Ferroni. Um, so it seems that we have different approaches in the neoadjuvant setting. Can each of you define what is total neoadjuvant therapy nowadays in your own institution? When, uh, Dr. O'Reilly, when do you send a patient for the surgeon to remove a local advanced pancreatic cancer? After four months, six months, eight cycles, eight cycles with long course of radiation? And similar question to uh, uh, Dr. Ferroni and Dr. Zurich. Yes, I, I think, uh, thank you. This is a great question. And acknowledging I come from an institution where surgery first has been the traditional role, we've been a little bit perhaps slower, rightly or wrongly, to, to move in a in a new adjuvant direction. But I, I, I do think once one commits to new adjuvant therapy, we like as oncologists to try to deliver all of the systemic treatment up front. So ideally four months, eight cycles of, of Fearnox is the plan. And maybe uh, to uh, commit to the question of total new adjuvant, the evolving radiation direction of ablative dosing of radiation uh, in terms of uh, a strategy uh, that uh, can uh, address the question of locally advanced disease and then weighing out uh, where surgery fits after that. So I would say for us, as, um, as Eileen said, um, four months or eight cycles of full furanox followed by chemo radiation. And if there's arterial involvement, we do 50.4 gray. And then after the 50.4 gray, we wait six weeks prior to resection. We have debated very heavily whether, uh, based on the prodige and considering adjuvant therapy is truly six months of full furanox, whether or not our patients should get an additional uh, four cycles of full furanox. But uh, at this point, we have not standardized uh, additional chemotherapy for our patients. Adjuvant treatment to follow? To follow, right? Because, uh, you know, based on the prodige, we, we should be giving them six months of full furanox. Correct. Um, and so we debate heavily whether there should be additional chemotherapy given. And of course, some of it is very subjective as to how the patient looks and what the path report looks like. Dr. Zurich. Yeah, we feel TNT should be, you know, chemotherapy up front with, with minimal to no adjuvant therapy. Uh, obviously, it's hard to call that when you're in the midst of neoadjuvant therapy because you don't know the pathology. For example, this patient had a 19-9 normalization but had... Uh, two or three possible uh, positive lymph nodes, as Curtis was just saying. So uh, for us, it's, you know, trying to extend TNT as long as possible. A minimum of four months is, is, re is required on our end. We don't do radiation. I think uh, we can argue this for, for a long time, but certainly the LAP07 uh, uh, trial and others have shown, uh, uh, and even, you know, Matt Katz's recent uh, Alliance trial has shown, uh, you know, some raise some questions, new questions about radiation. So I think for these operations, you, you make a potentially difficult operation more difficult. Uh, it is potentially uh, threatening in terms of uh, the vascular anastomosis that you do. And I know Jin He just put a note there, which I agree with for these arterial reconstructions, which we also use transplant for, uh, the benefit of a total pancreatectomy uh, and uh, over a Whipple because of the risk of, of arterial blowout should also be considered. But for us, TNT would be uh, systemic therapy, minimal use of radiation, and uh, the, uh, the uh, vision of not giving adjuvant therapy on the back end. Great points. Uh, but just to point out as well that the Alliance trial of the CATS was for the borderline resectable population, not the local advance. Correct. Uh, Dr. O'Reilly, uh, you have been a big advocate about uh, doing uh, uh, next genetic sequencing, general mutation analysis, and somatic mutation analysis. Is this actually needed in a patient with uh, local advanced tumor to define neoadjuvant therapy, or uh, is this strictly needed? Yeah, I think kind of actionable mutation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for that. I, I think we're not there yet in terms of being able to have the information in approximate real time to be able to use it to define treatment. But I hope that we're not too far away from being able to do that. And uh, it's, you know, we're at the, 
cusp of this, right? And so what we're doing now is hopefully not what we're doing in three years, not to mind five years, but it'll be a much more refined and sophisticated version of both germline, somatic sequencing, ctDNA analysis, and all the other biomarkers that we can think of that may allow us to better select, again, for a given person, an assigned treatment. That's where we hope we'll be. Excellent. Uh, last round of questions, Dr. Ferronel Grzurica. In uh, calendar year 2020, how many whipples with uh, 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 vascular resection and reconstruction, arterial, I'm asking, and uh, ha have been performing at your institution? I know you follow and track your outcomes pretty well. For us, it's less than five, um, but I would also say uh, the year of 2020 was an interesting year with COVID. So I'm not sure it's a good reflection of what, of what we've been doing, but I would say less than 5% of the cases we do get arterial resection reconstruction. I would say the same thing on the right side of the pancreas, uh, but obviously with an Appleby operation, relatively more straightforward arterial resection and reconstruction. If you put those in, it'll probably be around 10%, but purely right-sided tumors with SMA or common hepatic artery reconstruction, probably 5% or less. Yeah, I so it's agree, still, um, it's still a rare event, happen. right? It's not a very common surgery. I think we like to uh, look at these videos and look at the pictures, but it's still, it's a small subset of patients that actually benefit of that. Dr. Ferroni, do you find yourself doing less arterial resections because of IORT? You publish on mitigating the effect of an R1 resection. Uh, is, this, is, is this asking, uh, uh, for, uh, allowing you to do less arterial resection? So uh, we definitely rely on IRT, and we are an institution that you know has been doing IRTs in the 1970s when Dr. Warshaw started it. There is what, what we really need to figure out is what is the biologic profile of the patients whose tumor responds to radiation? Because we know there is a subset, right? We even have a subset of locally advanced tumors that were never resected and that got gemcitabine, which really isn't very effective who are living more than five or 10 years because of that IORT. So clearly there's a biologic profile that we need to understand better that will be responsive to radiation. And once we figure that out, then we can put this radiation question to rest because we'll only give it to those who have a responsive tumor. Excellent points. Thank you so much for your participation. Excellent discussion and moderation, Dr. Ray. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next uh, panel. Uh, Thank you, the next panel for the liver case uh, will be uh, Dr. Karim Hallison from Cornell University, Dr. Adam Yop from UT Southwestern Medical Center, and Dr. Eduardo Santibanez from Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dr. Margiela Doyle, who was originally scheduled for this, couldn't participate due to some transplant duties. Uh, Dr. Martel will be our moderator. Dr. Martel, the mic is yours. Good evening. Um, thanks very much for allowing me to present. Let me share my screen briefly. Can you confirm that you can see this? Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Um, I think you've already introduced our esteemed panel. Um, I'm going to present a case of a 44-year-old uh, woman who's in Inuk Canadian, and I put this on the map for you to give you a flavor of how far these patients travel, which is part of their treatment, previously healthy, uh, presented with 10, week, 10 pounds of weight loss over about two weeks or so and some red upper quadrant pain. She underwent a workup at her local hospital, which was suggestive of a metastatic cancer. She had a scope by a local surgeon and a mass was found at 12 centimeters uh, from the anal verge and she had no symptoms to suggest uh, bowel obstruction. She was not uh, actively bleeding or anything of the sort. So she underwent formal staging and she was found to have multiple liver metastases, no uh, portal nodes, no carcinomatosis. Her primary tumor was found uh, to be a four centimeter rectal sigmoid tumor with extension into the mesentery. 60% of the circumference and one IMV lymph node. Uh, the remainder of the staging was uh, clear. Uh, pathology showed an invasive, well-differentiated, low-grade adenocarcinoma, uh, wild type, and microsatellite stable. Uh, I, I've cut up the CT for you in multiple sequences, but uh, 
you can get a sense that this is fairly bulky disease involving most segments of the liver uh, with relative sparing of 4A and 4B. This is pointing to one lesion and four. There's invasion into the caudate as well. This is a lesion you see here on the surface of 4B as well. And this is the other viewpoint. So let me start with the panel. What treatment options would you have at this point for this patient that, that's fairly young? I can see Dr. De Santibania. So do you want, do you okay. want to start with that? I, yes. Uh, every time uh, we are evaluating this patient in a multidisciplinary uh, fashion, uh, we try to decide if this unresectable a disease is due to unfortunate anatomy or because of unfortunate biology. I think this patient has unfortunate anatomy and is a, a synchronous tumor that if we refer to the FONG uh, uh, scoring system, uh, we have to, to think that also the biology is not so, uh, so good. But uh, I think that uh, uh, the patient uh, has, uh, in our institution, we will put this patient on chemotherapy uh, and see how it works. Because sometimes it's a wild, uh, it's a wild carraf, birraf, so uh, this is good. And sometimes you can surprise how much uh, this patient can uh, respond. And uh, uh, one, one thing we, we take care, uh, we look in this patient is the, the diameter of the huge uh, imaging. And the diameter of the uh, imaging in the right side is very big. She has a lot of, of tumor, but the segment four can be cleaned up. So I will not uh, uh, rule it out uh, uh, totally that this patient can in the future be candidate uh, for liver resection. Okay, any uh, other opinions? No, I agree. I think we would all probably agree that this patient's unresectable as the imaging shows. And um, we typically would give three to four months of systemic therapy and then re-image to see where we're at. Very well. Um, that's what we did. So this patient went on to have 12 cycles of full FOX. Uh, I guess we could argue about the different modalities of chemotherapy and, and restaging. Um, she had a, a mixed response that I'll show you, which I guess will form the basis for most of the discussion for this case. She has had some degree of shrinkage of the largest lesions with, with some degree of concurrent growth, particularly in 4A and 4B. So let me go through that. So you can see that the morphology of tumors has, has changed significantly, um, but there continues to be fairly bulky disease with some growth uh, differentially in, in uh, the left medial section. This uh, patient's CEA level, which I didn't give you, has, has decreased. So uh, we'll say from 200 to uh, around 20. What, what about the markers? The uh, CEA? The CEA, yeah, 200 to 20. And it increased or decreased? Decreased, okay. yeah. So um, here, here's a poll. So I don't know if we can run that poll. What would, what would folks do with this? Um, and then we can go through the panel and see what uh, your thoughts are. Here's the poll on the screen. Everybody in the audience is allowed to vote. So please go ahead, submit your responses. We wait a few seconds and this will show up on our screen. Is that how this works? William, you don't happen to have a PET scan to see how what what happened to the tumors, do you? Uh, I don't, no. <laughs> so go ahead. Why don't you take it from there? 
what, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, so because of because we're starting to think about transplant and there's data that shows that metabolic tumor volume is important and how well the tumors respond. And obviously not all tumors are responsive to, uh, not all tumors are going to be bright on PET, but if they are and if they do respond, you know, it's a good, I guess, biologic indicator of what's going on. Um, it's, I, I agree with Dr. Santabanius. This is, I think this patient has bad biology and bad anatomy at the same time. So, uh, you know, whether, whether any of these things are going to help, I'm not sure, but we've started doing PET scans for everybody that walks in because we're thinking about transplant and how we're going to follow these people down the line. So you use it from the viewpoint we, of trying to think about transplant down the line specifically, not to the set, not for resectability assessment. Well, resectability assessment too, but I mean, CT and the MRI is very good for assessing resectability. The data from Oslo shows that metabolic tumor volume is really a predictor of how well these patients are going to do, uh, you know, after transplant and those with high metabolic tumor volume don't do well. Since we're starting this out, we're trying to be more on the conservative side. So we're trying to be very selective about who we transplant. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Yock, you want to jump, jump in there? Yeah, I think at this point, it, this will be totally crazy, but uh, I'm sure I'll get a lot of heat for this. But uh, obviously, at this point, I think we would transition. I mean, take the social determinants out that she lives in the North Pole. Um, we, we would put a hepatic artery infusion pump in at this point um, due to kind of failure to convert to th resectable therapy at this, at, at this juncture. What do you do with the primary tumor in that in that situation? Yeah, we would we would take them both out at the same time. So, um, resect the primary as well as uh, as put in the hepatic artery infusion pump. We probably do it robotically or minimally invasive. Okay, and your your intent in doing so is to try to convert to resectable disease, or? Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think everybody can agree that that's probably the goal of this, right? I mean, we know that the long term survival is predicated by either conversion or resectability or, or making the patient a viable transplant candidate. And we would give FUDR with systemic therapy at this point. Okay. Um, I, sorry, I go ahead. Think, yes, I have a little disappointment with, the, uh, with this because I think that it is not demonstrated that if you resect the primary tumor, you are going to improve the disease of this patient first. Uh, maybe uh, the the pump can uh, can reduce the tumor low in this patient, and you can maybe in the future can be resectable. But this patient was not occluded; has not it, indication for resect the primary tumor. Yeah, it's to and, do with it's to do with putting in the pump. It's not. I agree. Um, otherwise, we we typically don't resect patients who are metastatic upfront um, by any stretch, and I totally agree with that. Um, it's just during when we put in the hepatic artery infusion pump, that's, that's pretty much standard of care to resect the primary. And that will also set up cream down the line if, if we do get into transplant. I mean, from a transplant perspective, we're seeing more and more patients who come in, come to us with undersectable disease and a primary in situ. And if they haven't responded to chemo, we wouldn't advocate removing the primary at all. I, I think I have a difference also with regard, regarding transplant because this patient is a very bad candidate for transplant. Because this patient has a bad biology, the only good is has a, a wild a, a rust, a, but this patient has a synchronous disease and the original a right tumor is huge, is more than 5.5, and this has been demonstrated in the SECA 2 trial from a, Norway. Also, this patient has high the CEA. So there is no, there is not a space also between the treatment of the primary and the, and the, and, and this patient has not respond to chemo because decrease the size of one of the tumor, but develop another tumor. So progress. And in my opinion, we, in this patient, we have used forceps, but we, 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 we will add in this patient for the beginning a biologics because it's a young patient and you have to put all the, all the, all the meat uh, in the barbecue. 
Uh, please don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting transplanting this patient in any reality or any world now. You know, there has to be a response. There has to be shrinkage. Dr. But, we have the results of that poll. Let's see what the audience said. Margie? That's interesting. That reflects the discussion we're having. Um, would, would you folks have chosen different chemotherapy modalities? I realize we're not medical oncologists, but uh, there are perhaps more aggressive regimens out there um, that, that may have been chosen in this patient. Is that a consideration or would you switch at this point? It's, I think it's a wide type, so you can use a cetuximab and a folfox is okay. And if it don't, don't work, after eight cycles, you can you can move to Folfiri and Bevacizumab if you want. But uh, I think this patient uh, need to be very aggressive with the with the chemotherapy. Okay, and I you... agree. Also, I agree that you can add any local uh, therapy. Maybe you can add uh, the, the the pump if you like the intraarterial that can be direct uh, with the pump or with a port as we use, or you can make a biological uh, proof put in uh, uh, by, by, by interventional radiology also. So you can do that. And also you can use uh, the, the, the use of yttrium 90 in this patient, if you like. But I think you, you need to be aggressive at combining the systemic treatment with, with any local treatment. So how would you go about choosing when to use, say that this, you mentioned yttrium 90, um, what would be its role in a case like that? Or, or is there any role for that in a case like that? I think, I think it's, it has a, we start with yttrium 90 in, 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 in 2012, uh, seven years ago, and we have done uh, 350 cases, 74 out of these were colorectal, advanced colorectal liver metastasis. You can use this as a salvage, or you can use it after first or second uh, line of uh, chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the procedure is very well tolerated, and sometimes uh, it exponents, exponentiates the, the role of chemotherapy. So it's well demonstrated that in, in several uh, uh, papers that have been published that the, the role uh, is, is very well demonstrated. After first line, second line, uh, or third line of chemotherapy, even in patients with, a, a, with Carras mutated. Okay. Um... Let me throw a few things in there to see whether that would influence folks' um, perception of the case. So we mentioned that a, a hepatic artery infusion pump could be included in this patient. Do any of these other things that I have here, so portohepatis metastatic lymph nodes or indeterminate lung lesions or low volume lung metastases influence your, your decision to go ahead with that uh, hepatic artery infusion pump, Dr. Yap? Yeah, I think low volume uh, lung metastasis would probably make you think pretty hard about putting a hepatic artery infusion pump. Um, the first couple probably plus or minus the indeterminate lung lesions. We never know what to do with. I don't think there's a lot of great data um, with genetic markers, either KRAS or BRAF mutations in a hepatic artery infusion pump, as well as the, even the meta microsatellite or MSI high tumors. Uh, but definitely the low volume lung metastasis would kind of cause you a little, especially with the light of how much liver disease you have. Adam, uh, uh, my point is that in this patient, I will try uh, to, uh, to decrease the, the amount of tumor without operating this patient. Because I think any, any, any intervention in this patient uh, can be a drawback, you know, for, for, for the tumor load. So uh, I think you can, you can uh, perform a, a biological test uh, with uh, interventional radiology and deliver the chemotherapy uh, 
through, through a catheter, uh, but not operating the patient, or you can use the, the TARE, uh, the radioembolization that is, is good and sometimes it can surprise uh, how much it can decrease. But, but this patient, uh, this patient looks when progress intrachemio, you have to change rapidly the, the chemo you are delivering. Yeah, but I mean, with the Y90, I mean, the goal is to see if you can get to a CTR to convert this guy or this patient to resectability. I just don't see that happening with Y90 therapy. You know, we, we know that, I mean, it's demonstrated that the patients that we can eventually convert to resectability have the longest survival. I think giving, I agree with being aggressive with the systemic therapy, we would have treated with systemic therapy with biologics right at the get-go. And then it been quickly to switch to a paddock artery infusion pump, probably with a Reno T can off the backside if he doesn't, if there is no response at three, three months. But I don't see Y90 ever getting us to that point of resectability. Um, and I think the idea of doing it minimally invasive with putting in a pump, I mean, most patients, even resecting the primary, it, you're not delaying chemotherapy very long. So I, I, don't, I, I don't carry that around with me very often. What, what are your thoughts about using hepatic artery infusion pumps in, in light of the, the lack of randomized data against uh, chemotherapy or with chemotherapy against systemic chemotherapy alone? I mean, that's the, the standard argument we hear about. And, and certainly in our environment, uh, pumps are very hard to get by. I mean, there's one program in, in our Canadian environment where we can get one. Uh, and so how does that factor in? Well, I think that's a great that's a great plug for why we need a, a randomized clinical trial, and that's what the previous hour we were actually in discussions um, with. Believe it or not, the you know it's always been a memorial driven um, kind of topic, and that's always been the criticism of it. But now, the previous hour there were 50, 50 different institutions on a call discussing a possible randomized trial in this very scenario uh, with people who are deemed unresectable. So I think that's the next logical step. There are plenty of randomized trials with the pump um, in resectable patients um, and also in adjuvant therapy, but not in this particular scenario. And this is, this is why I would call that the need to happen. Very well. Um, what, what would it take for a patient in, in, in the North American setting, I guess, to... Um, to be a candidate for transplantation, just to get the, the, the panel's thoughts. I mean, I my understanding is that this is a fairly rare event uh, still today uh, in, in our context for metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, I've certainly never had a patient who's gone on to transplant. Uh, and although we, we have that ability through our colleagues in, in Toronto, it's, it's very rare. Um, and so I'd like to hear what you have to say on that. I mean, I, I think, so, I think we, we can discuss this, but not in this patient. This is not the candidate, but we can right. discuss this because it's a, a, it's a very, very, very unusual indication in this time, but I wonder that in the future it's gonna be a good indication if we are, if we, if we are selecting a, uh, very well the patient. If not, we are going to say that a uh, liver transplant is not good uh, for a col unresectable colorectal liver med. And this depends on the selection of patients because the SECA2 uh, trial in, in Oslo is showing numbers that had not been seen before in the in overall survival uh, five years overall survival and also 10 years. So <clears throat> I think we can discuss this, but we have to discuss exactly the patient selection because liver transplant is the best surgery, oncological surgery that you can uh, offer to this patient because it's going to be radical. And this is not the challenge because the advanced in liver transplant are very important. The second, the problem is the selection. The second problem is the availability of donors. 
So we have to discuss if we are going to use uh, uh, cadaveric donors, if we are going to use the rapid or the appalled system with the just with the left lateral using as an Alps uh, uh, performing left hepatectomy, uh, putting an auxiliary left lateral liver, and in a second, four weeks later, uh, resect the, the, the right liver. So we have to discuss this, but the selection of the patient is the key of the uh, successful of a liver transplant. That's a good segue for some of the audience questions, Dr. Martel. Uh, Dr. Hallison, you have a, a, an open trial, I believe, for uh, liver transplant for patients with colorectal metastasis. What are the inclusion criteria? Kind of trying to well, better define the answers that Dr. Santibanez was mentioning. So, you know, I, I don't think we know if this person's a transplant candidate yet. I think they need more chemotherapy to see if they respond. I think you're Not right. Not this patient in, in general. I understand. Yeah. I understand. But, but, in, in, but in general, this, this patient may be, but with time. Uh, the inclusion criteria are people without their primary inside uh, who've had response to chemotherapy or stable disease. They have to have at least uh, uh, a year from the diagnosis of the tumor to the point of transplantation. Uh, the CEA can't be above 200 three months before the transplant. Um, uh, no evidence of metastases ever. So if they've had their, a, a long resected, even remotely, we, we would exclude them. Portohepatous nodes are an exclusion. Um, a positivity are an exclusion. Um, we're targeting people under 65 right now just because we're trying to be relatively conservative. Um, you know, we have four listed patients, Guillaume, currently. Uh, we've evaluated probably 10 or 12 that have uh, have gone by the wayside and at least two have died on the list. Um, it's hard to get organs because none of these, most of these patients don't have high metal score. It's even harder to give them a living donor when they've had a pump. I'm just gonna put that out there because most of the time the hilum needs to be reconstructed with a jump graft from the aorta and the, um, and the SMV because, you know, as the people who've operated on post-pump patients know, the hilum is, can often be a mess. So trying to find an, a, re, a usable artery is difficult. So living donation becomes very, very difficult. So does extended criteria uh, uh, livers because then you're taking an 80 year old liver with bad vessels and trying to reconstruct in a, in a, in a mess. Um, I think there's uh, eight centers who've currently done, according to Roberto Hernandez who presented last time, who've currently done these transplants. Six have active, you know, I wouldn't say live protocols, but protocols that they use. Um, uh, I think Roberto's done the most so far. Um, Dr. Hallison, uh, Dr. Uh, Santibanez mentioned the Zika trial a couple of times and yeah. it's uh, and, and emphasized the need of selection. However, yeah. both Zika 1 and Zika 2, even in one of their arms, they are willing to transplant patients only post six weeks of chemotherapy, which for most of us here, in, I think in, 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 in US, it seems too early to be aggressive with any local regional therapy. So uh, what would be the minimum amount of time that you would use or, or, or chemotherapy cycles that you would use to pull the trigger for transplant? Same question for Dr. Santibanez, if that would be a hypothetical scenario. And same question for Dr. Yob, how many cycles or length of systemic chemo before pull the trigger for a uh, hepatic artery pump? So our protocol is a year, not, not necessarily of chemo, but a year from the diagnosis. So that means a minimum of six months of chemo at least, you know, and I think if you ask the Norwegians, they'll tell you the same, you know, but you know, so even though SECA2 tells you that the tumors are larger, this patient's Oslo score is actually one, right? Because they only have big tumor. Their, 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 their time is, is undetermined yet. And their CEA has responded and the disease is, is relatively stable. So and there's a recent, there's a, there's a JAMA paper that's coming out soon where they showed that there's actually survival benefit for transplanting patients with bigger tumors that are bigger, that are, and more than nine tumors versus uh, resecting those patients. Dr. Yop? Yeah, I think the key is, is not to have mission creep, right? With, yeah. with doing transplant for colorectal liver metastasis. Yeah. Um, it sounds like a great idea. SACA 1, SACA 2, 36 patients, right? Let's, I think we need to, take that into consideration. Um, what's going to be very interesting to see are these registry trials out of Toronto and what Cream's doing in Cornell to see exactly how patients do long term. And I think that's the big key is, you know, I, I don't think we've, you know, 
I look at the panelists or the comments and I see Dr. Fong saying there, he probably remembers when, col when transplant for colorectal liver metastasis was common back in the eighties. And I'm sure Eduardo does too. And it's seemingly we're back to where we were and without that much new data. So I think we have to be careful. Thank you so much at all the panelists. In the interest of time, we're gonna to move to our next uh, case, our uh, gallbladder cancer case. Uh, the panelists for this one is, uh, are gonna be Dr. Yulon Fong from City of Hope, Dr. Melissa Hogue from North Shore uh, University Health System, and Dr. Flavio Rocha from HSSU. Our moderator is Dr. Kelly Lafaro from John Hopkins University. Dr. Lafaro, mic is yours. Great, thank you so much. Sorry, I was not letting me unmute. I just want to thank our uh, panelists who are on tonight for staying to the end and thank you to the audience as well. So the case that we have to present tonight is the early gallbladder cancer. Uh, I need to introduce our panelists. They're all very well known. Uh, start with the case. For our case, we have a 65-year-old woman who has no relevant past medical or past surgical history. She presented to an outside hospital emergency room with postprandial abdominal pain as well as nausea. Her labs were unremarkable, and she had an ultrasound which showed mild thickening of the gallbladder wall to eight millimeters and multiple gallstones. She underwent a laparoscopic cholecystectomy for presumed cholecystitis uh, on that hospitalization and was discharged home the next day without issue. Her pathology returned as a 2.5 centimeter adenocarcinoma in a disrupted gallbladder. With moderate to, it was moderate to well differentiated. The tumor invaded the perimuscular connective tissue without serosal involvement. All of the margins were negative, including the cystic duct margin. And she had a positive LVI as well as PNI with a pathologic stage of T2 and X, there was no lymph nodes in the specimen. So first I just wanted to start out and talk about um, how everyone on the panel would stage uh, the patient. So if she came into your office, Dr. Fong, uh, what do you find the best way is to stage these patients who come in with incidental gallbladder cancers? Yeah, so for a incidentally discovered gallbladder cancer, uh, again, I, I, many staging I, I ways can do it, uh, but obviously what we're after here is that if it's a T2 gallbladder cancer, and I, you know, most of the time when we take out a gallbladder for gallstones, we don't take off the serosal surface of the, of the, uh, on the liver side. Uh, that's a cystic plate, and we usually leave that in place. So if uh, they, uh, go, uh, the tumor was actually on that side, and uh, we almost certainly have left cancer in place. It's also the lymphatic uh, channels that live there. And uh, the biggest worry really is the disruption here and, uh, and whether the gallbladder cancer has been spilt, whether there are lymph nodes that are positive. And so for that uh, staging, I, I probably would uh, go do an MR and uh, and. And depending on my level of worry, I, I usually do a PET scan before surgery. And the only question is, in this case, when do you go do all of that? Okay, do you do that immediately? Uh, do you come back? I certainly would examine the patient and feel for anything that's in the, each of the port sites. And that's because, again, that would uh, make life kind of easy for me in terms of deciding what to do if I felt a big lump uh, were already growing in, a, in one of the port sites which actually happens in these T2 gallbladder cancers. The only way you can truly spread it peritoneally and into the port sites is by spilling it. Dr. Hogue, uh, what would you do? Yeah, I think for, um, for staging, my preference would be um, a CT. Um, I would look at the preoperative ultrasound to determine you know, whether or not um, I would get an MRI. I think also in terms of the path, like whether there's a uh, knowledge, whether it was on the liver side or not. I mean, it, with an eight millimeter wall on ultrasound, but a 2.5 centimeter mass, you know, I'm wondering if something was, it was missed there too uh, from, um, you know, from the, the surgeon that went to, went there. Um, I don't routinely do PET um, unless there's something that I'm concerned about 
um, on the, the staging CT scan. So I guess, you know, to summarize, mostly CT, MRI, if I was concerned on ultrasound um, or path that there may be some, uh, lo some liver involvement and, and no uh, PET CT. I, I don't do a staging laparoscopy remote from uh, the, the proposed operation potentially. Well, let's say the reason I go with the PET I, I, on these is that a retropancreatic node that's positive, I, it does it for me. Okay? And I, I've seen many T2s that actually have very extensive nodal I, I, I disease. I, the most extensive one I've ever seen I actually went into the aorta cable space all the way down to both iliacs and uh, on positive nodes, uh, even though it was a, a papillary tumor within the gallbladder. So, uh, I only do that because uh, then it makes it really easy for me as to make decisions because obviously the decision is now whether to go back or not. And, uh, and, and it, it, it's uh, never an easy decision as to when you go back on one of these. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Dr. Roca. Yeah, no, I don't have much to add to what my esteemed colleagues have mentioned. I think the question is always the timing of disease, especially of the staging studies, because if you had a disrupted gallbladder, there was bad cholecystitis, if you get the PET too early, you may have some false positives. But I completely agree with Dr. Fong about the nodal distribution. That's critically important. And I think that gets overlooked at times as far as the, the distribution uh, of where those nodes are. Okay, thank you. So I... Do you have a CT scan um, a little bit? There's really on the CT scan. He also had a CA199 drawn 47 and a CEA. Um, so this is going to be a poll for the audience before we kind of get into the meat of the the discussion here is what would you do next? Uh, the first option being surveillance. The next option being return to the operating room for liver resection and lymphadenectomy. The third option being chemotherapy followed by liver resection and lymphadenectomy if there's no progression of disease. And fourth would be chemotherapy and radiation followed by surgery if there's no progression. So I'm gonna give everybody a minute to respond here. All right, so starting, well, I guess go in reverse order, Dr. Roca, um, for you in a patient who had technically a T2, although no lymph nodes evaluated and a negative margin with a CT scan that doesn't show any evidence of disease, what would, your, what would you do next for this patient? Yeah, so uh, this is actually a, a very good case for discussion like this because uh, the first thing even before going into uh, contemplating surgeries, I would actually have the pathology re-reviewed at my own institution. And I think that's an important point to make. Um, and you try to get as much information up front as possible. Have the, uh, the cystic duct, you know, again, if it was um, uh, not examined, have it examined. Uh, if you can't, try to talk to the surgeon uh, and get, get a sense of what the operative, uh, you know, details were. I mean, if this one was disrupted, so I am concerned that there's maybe some seeding there. And I think that's the biggest problem with incidental gallbladder cancer is that folks are getting an inadequate oncologic operation up front. Um, if you were to tell me what standard of care, well, I think standard of care at this point is going to be in this patient who's properly staged is to go have a staging laparoscopy followed by an attempt at re-resection and lymphadenectomy. And we can talk about the steps involved. I am concerned about the disruption though, so it wouldn't be unreasonable to think about preoperative chemotherapy, although we don't have the data to support that at this time. As you know, we do have a trial, Dr. Maythel has EA2197, which has recently been activated, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point during this discussion. Great, thanks. Dr. Hogue? Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, what Dr. Rocco was mentioning in terms of talking to the surgeons. Um, and um, I, I don't necessarily uh, routinely have all pathology reviewed, uh, not necessarily pertinent to this case, but anything with high grade dysplasia or anything that has like some sort of uh, disparity on the, uh, on the pathology that needs to be worked up, I'll, I'll have re-reviewed. Um, and then in terms of, uh, 
you know, in terms of uh, resection, I, I would do a staging laparoscopy, you know, prior to re-resection and the lymphadenectomy. Great. Dr. Fong? Yeah, so for the trainees on the call, I, the answer, the board answer is staging laparoscopy and if negative, a, a re-resection of the liver bed followed by lymph node sampling and plus or minus a bowel duct resection, plus or minus staging resection of the port sites that were staging not to survive. But in reality, this is a skinny person who's young, okay? And uh, those, so there are uh, other nuances that are at play here. Almost certainly the colon is now stuck to where the pinky is, okay? And uh, so I always talk to the patient about the fact that when we go back, it's highly likely that I'm gonna at least keep the wedge resection of the colon, because she has no fat between the colon and the and the gallbladder bed. I will talk to the patient about the fact that the likelihood of no positive is about uh, at least 35%. And if it is low down on the duct, right on the pancreas, what are we gonna go do? How aggressive does she wanna be? That's because it took me a long time to figure out why the Japanese surgeons would do a ripple. These are the ones, okay? These are the guys, uh, these are the cases where it's actually a small like, gallbladder cancer and, and you don't need to do much of the liver resection, but now you find nodes or you find the cystic duct positive down by the pancreas. And so what do you go do? You just go in and do a little extra uh, and, and not really do a cancer operation. I mean, you go a ripple for these patients, okay? That's also why I pet these folks. And because uh, if I see anything behind the pancreas, I go, hmm, really bad disease. Maybe we should treat you up front with chemotherapy. Because the reality also is that if you go and resect this patient and the patient's no positive, in America right now, standard of care is capsidity, okay? And uh, whereas we treated with neoadjuvant, it is really uh, uh, probably gem plus, plus a platinum of some type, probably is a better therapy up front. And so that's why there are all these nuances on these young patients that get gallstone surgery and suddenly discover they have a terrible cancer and now you actually have to go do something. And, uh, and so again, I, I, you know, that's why I no longer write about this stuff anymore, guys. I used to write about all this stuff because I really don't, don't want them coming to see me. I wanted to take care of the straightforward colon case like the last case, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think that brings up a really good point that, you know, we'll talk about a little bit later is, is the options of chemotherapy um, that you have if you give the patient chemotherapy prior to surgery, you know, versus adjuvant therapy. Um, so I don't know if those poll results, if we can post them to see what the audience. They're up. Oh, they are. Okay, perfect. All right. So pretty much what I would expect, I think split between going back immediately for restaging liver resection and lymphadenectomy versus chemotherapy you know, followed by surgery. And I, we will talk about the, the new trial a little bit later, which I, I think will be ex, will answer exactly this question. Let me ask the panelists something. Uh, sure. So let's say we go back, uh, which is standard care, right? This is now we're in the operating room and, and we do a full culturization and we flip up the head of the pancreas and we, I usually take a lymph node at the very top of the pancreas, I call it the peripancreatic sentinel lymph node for biliary cancer. And that's because if that node's positive, people kind of do poorly, okay? And that node is positive in this patient. What do you do? You quit, you do a dissection behind the pancreas, you do a ripple, what do you do, now, Melissa? Yeah, no, I mean, I think if there was a concern for a positive, like aortic cable node, um, and you sent it for frozen, and the frozen did diagnose um, a positive lymph node, which I think, you know, there's a good chance of having a sampling bias since they, you know, they only slice one and it could be microscopic disease. So as part of my routine practice, I don't always take that node before striding forward unless there's something concerning uh, on preoperative imaging that I couldn't potentially biopsy beforehand with an EOS. But if, if, if that was positive, I would consider it beyond the scope of the resection. Yeah, I would, I would concur. In fact, that's what I strive with my trainees is, you know, I do do that after laparoscopy, do a full coker, palpate the aortic cable space. And I think the node you're referring to, Dr. Fong, is station 13, which is right at the top of the pancreas. Yep. And it's what's interesting about that node is that it's considered, you know, most of us would consider it out of bounds for a gallbladder cancer. The interesting 
tumor site, those with a hyalur cholangio, who considers that out of bounds or is that in bounds? And certainly it would be for a left-sided cholangio, but perhaps for a right-sided cholangio, I would consider it, but that's beyond yeah. the scope of this discussion. So Flavio, the reason I take that note is because it separates the bile duct from the portal vein. It allows me to look behind the bile duct mm -hmm. in front of the portal vein. And that's why I, 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 it's one of my first leaf notes that I sample simply because technically it frees up the entire portal hepatitis when you do my work. And, uh, but then I started looking at what happens to those patients where that note is possible. It's kind of bad. But in a, in a young, young person, I, I've done a number of ripples in that situation when uh, they, the primary uh, tumor on the liver is not that big. So the liver is actually really is major. And, uh, and, and again, uh, affairs of the heart, and some of them have lived a long time. And uh, so that's why I'm convinced that's why the Japanese surgeons do this. And, uh, and it took me the longest time to figure it out. And I just wonder whether we should do more of it uh, for the early, uh, early T-stage cancer with no positivity in the, in the retropancreatic area. Would anyone send this node routinely for frozen section you know, at the time after your cochlear? I don't, unless I'm worried, I'm concerned about it. Uh, but I, it is where I start my uh, my nodal dissection and then sweep everything up from the port of hepatitis. Flavio, call it the sentinel lymph node, then we can have one, okay? <laughs> the surgeons need it. <laughs> I, I would, but I... You can't be an oncologist without it. So, so just call it the sentinel lymph node, send it for frozen. <laughs> I, I would, but I just found out that my frozen room is 45 minutes away here on campus, so <laughs> it'll take too long. <laughs> Makes you uh, second guess your frozen sections. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> All right, I wanted to move a little bit and just talk about the resection. You know, as Dr. Fong had kind of brought up some points uh, already, but in terms of, you know, ultimately uh, the patient will have chemotherapy or upfront you know, diagnostic laparoscopy followed by liver resection uh, and lymphadenectomy. But I wanted to go through a few things. Number one, um, whether or not you routinely do a diagnostic laparoscopy on that, um, that morning of surgery. Uh, and then wanted to talk about the extent of your liver resection. I think we pretty much covered the lymphadenectomy, but you can talk a little bit about that. And then whether or not you go back and resect your port sites and a new cystic duct margin if that margin was negative. So why don't, Dr. Hogue? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I definitely always do a diagnostic laparoscopy. Um, I think uh, a couple things in terms of the formal uh, 4B5 and port sites. I, I would have to say earlier in my practice, like when I first started, it, it seemed like the textbook answer. So I definitely did a lot of 4B5 you know, five as well as port site excision. Uh, but now I don't do that. I don't think there's been any data to show that, you know, uh, excision of the port sites uh, prolongs survival, but it, it may stage, uh, you know, but they, they could probably also have peritoneal carcinomatosis. Um, I do typically do a further cystic duct resection. It's not necessarily for an additional margin, but you know, I think you can get more nodes along that area because as you come up along the bile duct laterally, you know, roll it, um, you know, roll it medially, get behind the uh, the bile duct in, into that portal vein groove, and then just kind of keep following that up, take the cystic duct and all the way up to the right hepatic artery. So, so typically I do it more for clearance and just to know that, you know, it's at the furthest end of my resection. And I, I won't send it for a frozen if the if the cystic duct margin was negative on the, uh, the original path. And I do typically uh, do these uh, robotically. Okay, perfect. That was gonna be the next question to talk about. Um, Dr. Fong? I mean, you talked about a little bit about it, but in terms of formal liver resection as yeah. well as port sites and um, further yeah. cystic duct resection. So the diagnostic laparoscopy I do is I, I don't dissect out the area where the cancer was. I, I look down the pelvis real quick and uh, that's because there are so many patients with little, uh, with the early cancer with peritoneal disease down the pelvis. If I go, if, even if I put a port in, I see ascites of any type, okay, even a little ascites, there's cancer, I just have to go look for it. And, uh, and it, it really is helpful not to have a patient open and being on the ward for four days where every day you have to go by to explain why you made the decision and, uh, and the patient is suffering. And uh, I, do, I do only as much liver resection as I need to, to uh, get all the tumors on. Uh, 
I no longer do a giant section of any type there unless I have to. And the only thing that makes me do a right low uh, for these cancers is that it turns out the cancer somehow on the bio duct has involved the right hand artery. And, uh, and that might make me do more, but again, I do as limited a liver section as possible because that's usually not the problem. Lymphadenectomy, I, I clear out I, 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 all of those stations that are normally done, but I no longer routinely take the bile duct. Uh, in my beginning of my career, uh, three decades ago, uh, we used to routinely take the bile ducts and take the right lung. I mean, that was just standard for what we did even for our own ball back cancer. Never, never made sense then, and I'm glad we stopped doing it. And then so, and then the port site, I take them out for three reasons, okay? It's not for savage because there's so much data that says not, not uh, a problem. I had uh, not a solution, I'm sorry, not a solution. One is that it really does help me stay in certain areas. The quartz are positive, that's a perineal disease, okay? And uh, second, it drives the chemotherapy, okay? Then the adjuvant is not capsidogene, which really is done chemotherapy for the patient. And third is that I've seen enough fistulae for people who get Portside recurrence and get radiated on the portside recurrence. And then a fistula from the colon is the next thing that happens. And then the patient's in my office. And now I have to figure out what to do about that fistula. Or do I let the patient die this miserable death with a, a, a fecal fistula through the port site? I've seen that like three times in my career. So I just take it out so that there's nothing on the outside that becomes a, a local problem later. And uh, But again, it's not for survival. It is for staging for chemotherapy and to prevent some uh, silly local solution that makes the patient worse later. And robotic versus open? I still tend to do these open and uh, I, I simply because I feel for stuff in there, okay? And uh, and that's because, so you go in, you see gallstones in the right upper quadrant. Well, the stuff around the gallstones is it cancer, not cancer, okay? My fingers actually help me a little bit there uh, as to how much I dissect and, and what I do. And, uh, and so this is one of those strange operations where it's really not that much surgery in, in, in total, where I still feel better feeling it uh, simply because I don't want to wonder. And, and this particular patient that we're talking about here, I bet you whoever goes back is going to see gallstones up there. Okay? <laughs> and then what do you go do? Do you go reach up behind the liver and feel for other things and do you dissect the diaphragm? This is a young, skinny patient. Boy, you know, I just want to make sure that everything that can be gotten gone is gone. Uh, even though if it's really peritoneal, it's bad news, right? And uh, but again, so these young people just tug in my heart. Thank you for that, Doctor. Ro we have a few minutes left. Um, we'd love to get your opinion on this, and then we can transition sure. a little bit. Yeah, so talk about the upcoming trial that just opened. Perfect. Yeah, I like to do these through a, a single subcostal port. Um, and that gives me, as Dr. Fong mentioned, um, the way to palpate. And I think that's the way to really take, take care of this disease. Um, I do like the formal 4B5 resection. Um, I think that that's, you know, as a liver surgeon, uh, we, we should be able to, you know, these, this is an anatomic operation that we should perform. Especially if you see residual disease on a CT scan, uh, then obviously scraping the cystic plate is not going to be adequate. Um, I do think, though, I like to vary sometimes based on what I see in the lymph nodes. So if I have a bunch, bunch of bulk, bulky lymph nodes in the porta, and if I decide to send one for, for a frozen and it's positive, then I feel less engaged about doing the big liver resection in a patient with node positive disease. So in that case, especially if there's no visible disease on CT or ultrasound, I might just do a cystic plate you know, uh, excision. Uh, I do do the laparoscopy first beforehand. Um, and I'm just, I do not resect the port sites. I think, you know, uh, my colleague, Dr. Makers, had a nice paper on the, on the utility of it. Um, my concern is not resecting the inside, the peritoneal side, but how do you know what the tract was, right? It's a three-dimensional, sometimes it's a Z-shaped uh, path. So I, I wouldn't want to make any kind of full thickness defects where I don't know the path. And so I'll just finish up a little bit. This patient did wind up having surgery uh, with a 4B5 resection of portal lymphadenectomy with one out of 10 lymph nodes positive for adenocarcinoma, um, and uh, as well as the common hepatic artery lymph node just sent separately uh, so that we knew where the lymph, if any of the lymph nodes were positive were. 
Um, adjuvant therapy, you know, I think really what would be great to talk about in our limited time left before we get to questions is the EA2197 opt-in trial. And I think, Dr. Roca, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about it. I know you've been um, involved in it pretty extensively. And I think we'll really get to answer that question um, and the concern of, of, ad, of uh, giving chemotherapy versus operating up front on these patients. Yeah, I think and let's let's uh, be clear. This is Dr. Uh, Shisher Mathel is the PI on, yes. on the, no, I know on you're the, the trial. PI, but I know you. I, I, I just happen to be the SWAC champion for it. Um, <laughs> so I'm the cheerleader. Um, so I think that what, what's born out of this trial is the fact that even in these patients that we resect, we're seeing you know significant recurrence rates. So you're talking about 40% recurrence rates at one year, which is just intolerable. As Dr. Fong mentioned, yes, the standard of care is capecitamine based on the Bill Cap trial. But keep in mind that the majority of patients were actually not gallbladder cancers in that trial. Um, there was actually a, a very old trial from Japan looking at adjuvant mitomycin in 5-FU that was a positive trial in the per protocol population, but not in the intent to treat. Uh, so I think that was the rationale. And when this trial was designed, there was a lot of debate. And in fact, the control arm did change from observation to capecitabine to actually the, the intervention arm is now uh, GEMSYS. And I don't know if you have the uh, picture of the schema, Kelly, or not. Um, and as you know, the current Actica trial in, um, in Germany is actually evaluating GEMSYS versus capecitabine in the adjuvant setting. So we should get that answer in a few, uh, hopefully uh, soon. Great, I actually don't have the schema up here um, and we are almost oh. out of time, but I do have one question, just wanted to get your thoughts. You know, there's some data, phase two data, showing um, that gem cisabraxane in combination has greater efficacy than gem cis alone. Uh, and just thinking about the trial design for opt-in, you know, do, you, do you think, you know, Dr. Ropa, Dr. Hope, Dr. Fung, that ultimately this might wind up being a combination to study, you know, instead of looking at gem cis? We appreciate a yes or no answer. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're running over. Dr. Fong, Dr. Rocha? Uh, I'll just say that the, the GAP regimen, the uh, 1815 has just finished closing, so we'll have an answer for you, at least in the <laughs> metastatic setting. That is a lymph no, one lymph node positive metastatic to the setting. Excellent. Well, uh, excellent discussion and moderation for all our panelists and, and, and moderators. Uh, we're just on time. I want to thank you all for your attendance, and I will turn it to Dr. Tim Pauly for the closing remarks. Thank you, everybody. So, uh, I just want, I, thank you, Dr. Polanco. I just want to echo Dr. Polanco's uh, uh, gratitude and thanks to all of our speakers tonight, all of our moderators, and I also want to thank um, all of you who joined us tonight um, and for your membership in the AHPBA. Um, we've been very purposeful in trying to have uh, these webinars on a, a monthly uh, basis to bring added value to our uh, members during this uh, time. Um, so I'm very grateful for uh, all of you having joined us. I do want to remind you that we are uh, still having our meeting and we're hoping uh, that it will be in person um, in Miami um, in August. Uh, so please um, put that on your calendars, get vaccinated. And I hope to see you all there and we promise to um, have the appropriate measures in place to be socially distanced and safe, but together. Uh, so with that, I wish you all well. Um, have a good night. Uh, please stay safe and stay well. Thank you again. Goodbye. Take care. Take care, my friend. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, thank everyone. You. Great job. Really wonderful. Thank you.